Well, good morning again. It is good to see everyone here and those who are visiting today, who were at the wonderful wedding yesterday. We welcome you and are happy to have you here with us today. And I would say to you that you have brought evidently the cold weather from Nigeria because we are not used to weather this cold, so you must have brought it with you because it is extremely cold here and difficult to travel. But anyway, we had a wonderful day yesterday and, uh, and we're glad to be here today on a very cold and difficult day to travel. Well, today, this morning, I'm here to talk about the manger and swaddly cloths. Well, let's see, that's what Brother Tom said we talk about. So I don't want to disappoint. We're going to talk about that, and we're going to look in Luke chapter 2 this morning. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 14. But before we turn to Luke chapter 2, I want us to consider the world in which we live. And I want us to look at some of the modern objections to Christianity and to look at those objections in light of Luke chapter 2. Now let me read a few of the objections that we will encounter. One objection is, well if you believe Jesus is the only way, isn't that too narrow? Isn't it too narrow if you believe Jesus is the only way? And does this passage in Luke have anything to say to us about that? Or another objection people would say is, how could Christianity be true if the majority of people in the world don't believe it? How could it be true if a majority don't believe it? Another one, what matters is really only if you are sincere in what you believe. Sincerity is the key. What really matters is, are you sincere? It doesn't really matter that much what you believe, so long as you are sincere in what you believe. Now, that's another objection. Or another one, don't all religions basically teach the same thing? Aren't all religions basically the same after all? That's another objection. Or doesn't God accept good people? Aren't good people the people that go to heaven? Aren't good people the people that have a relationship with God? Or another one, won't God forgive you or accept you if you're really sorry for what you have done? And after all, isn't it really arrogant? Not only is it narrow, not only is it exclusive, but isn't it arrogant to say that Jesus is the only way? And then here's one very popular today. If Christianity works for you, that's great. It just doesn't work for me. But if it works for you, good. But it doesn't work for me. Now these are the sorts of things that we hear in our culture today. We hear these things all the time. There was a news broadcaster about eight years ago who made a critical, well not really a critical comment about a celebrity. This celebrity had found himself in immorality. And he was in a lot of problems. And the news broadcaster said, well he really needs to come to Jesus because he needs to have a redemption and a forgiveness. And the television networks went berserk as though this guy had said some sort of a great blasphemy to, to imply that this particular celebrity needed to come to Jesus. But is what he said, was that such a bad thing? Or was that a good thing? And some of the criticisms of this particular newsman was that, well, he's claiming to be holier than thou. And this man is judging other religions because he said this particular celebrity didn't believe in Christ and pursued another way. And he's saying he needed to come to Christ for redemption. And so when we say some of these things in the world in which we live, people don't always respond in a positive way. As a matter of fact, in a politically correct world, they respond in a negative way. But as Tom said, the birth of Jesus Christ sets in motion an essential and exclusive plan of God for salvation, which requires a Savior. Which requires a Savior. And that's what we're going to look at in the manger, in the swaddling cloths, in the man he grew up to be.
So in Luke chapter 2, let's begin. Now in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. And notice when we read in the Bible, the Bible is not like a, a book of myths where it says, in a distant country, long ago, there was a prince. The Bible tells us a specific place in this land of Israel. It gives us this geographic location of Syria. It gives us the name of a ruler when Quirinius was governor in Syria and when Caesar Augustus was Caesar in Rome. So we have time and place uh, mentions or references in the Bible that we can look at, that we can go to secular history and we can compare to them. And so when Caesar Augustus issued this census of all the inhabited earth, when the first census while Quirinius was governor in Syria, well, what happened? And everyone went on his way or everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of in the family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who was engaged to him and was with child. And we see here that God, in his superintending hand, his sovereign hand, ordered events so that Joseph, who lived in Nazareth, who was betrothed to Mary, who was with child, would go to Bethlehem. Now we know that's important. I think Jace mentioned it. Jamal here is from Bethlehem Ephrathah. Micah the prophet chapter 5 verse 2 says, But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be named among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. So we know that the Messiah had to be born in Bethlehem. The Christ, the Messiah, the coming one, he who is come to come into the world, that the scriptures all look forward to his coming. If you were a Jewish person at that time, you should have been looking forward to a Messiah who was to come and a new covenant which was to come and that the Messiah himself would be the one who would bring the new covenant. Malachi chapter 3 verse 1, it says, but, but as for me, I will send my messenger before me and he will prepare the way and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming. So this messenger of the covenant, this Messiah, who's the Lord himself, the Lord whom you delight, he's going to come. And so they should have been looking for that and he was to be born in Bethlehem. So we might say God might have tapped Caesar Augustus on the shoulder and said, how about a census? And let's issue this decree for a census, and this census will move Joseph and Mary to Bethlehem so that when she's to give birth to her firstborn son, they'll be there. And so we read in verse 6, while they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth, and she gave birth to her firstborn son. And the implication, if he was her firstborn son, she had others, and we read that in other passages, but this son was unique because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit as we looked at last week. And so she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. You know, some of that actually is a little more difficult to know all the specifics than we might think there. But the idea of cloths, it's possible that he was wrapped in swaddling cloths. It's possible that those also were used to wrap a body when one died. And so there could be some symbolism there that this foreshadowed the fact that he was born to die. And I think that's possible. It's maybe even likely. I don't know that for sure, but I think that's possible. When it says a manger here, the word manger probably has the idea of a feeding trough. Was it made of wood? It could have been. Could it have been made and cut out of a wall in a cave? Uh, some of the early tradition was that Jesus was born in a cave of some sort or another, and I think that's possible. The idea that there was no room for them in the inn, the word in there in English probably gives us an idea that's not altogether accurate. Sometimes the word in or that word could be used to refer to a particular area in a home. 
and there would be one area in a home where primarily where well the people would live and there would be another area in the home where the animals would live and so the idea here which I think is more likely and again I can't prove this but it's more likely it seems to me that they came to a home there and it was crowded and so uh, there wasn't room where normally people would be and so they were in an area where animals were kept it could be that there was a house built on a cave or built on a hillside where there was an underneath cave that's certainly uh, very possible and I'm I'm happy to say that I was able to visit Bethlehem Ephrathah several years ago and to see some of these areas as well uh, again we don't know for sure where I don't think that's important because we know it was there Amen. and so he was born there in in some sort of a humble dwelling and I think the idea of a manger probably has this idea in the most humble of dwellings and so uh, the Herodian maybe you can look down on Bethlehem from there and the king would be up there but the king of kings is born down here and he humbled himself as we read in Philippians uh, and became a servant and he became a bond servant and so this is the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior because there was no room for them in the inn or the upper chamber and then we read in verse 8 in the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night we might be surprised that these early uh, receivers of the message were not uh, prophets were not uh, preachers were not uh, Pharisees and scribes but God appeared to these shepherds staying in the fields and keeping watch over their flock by night men who worked and men who took care of their flocks even at night and the angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were terribly frightened but the angel said to them do not be afraid for behold I bring you good news of a great joy which shall be for all the people for today in the city of David there is born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord now this is the message this is the gospel this is at least the beginning of the gospel because all the promises all the promises of God of a Savior all the promises of God of a new covenant all the promises of God of salvation are all embodied in this one little package maybe six pounds maybe seven pounds who knows how big but of a frail human all the nations of the earth are to receive blessing from him remember when Simeon came into the temple and he says Lord let thy bondservant depart in peace according to thy word for mine eyes have seen thy salvation which thou hast prepared in the presence of all peoples a light of revelation to the Gentiles in the glory of thy people Israel so in this little baby you see the light of the nations and you see the glory of Israel let's look at it again do not be afraid for behold I bring you good news of a great joy which shall be for all the people not just for the Jew but for the Jew and the Gentile alike for today in the city of David there is born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord that's the key there is born for you a Savior well we're gonna come back to that but let's go to verse 12 this will be a sign for you you will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger and again the sign is a little hard to understand and to be wrapped in cloths is a little hard to understand but it seems to me like it's probably something unusual because if it wasn't unusual why would it be a sign so the idea here it, it could just mean well it's unusual that the baby's going to be in a manger it's unusual that a baby would be put in an animal's feeding trough it's unusual perhaps that a baby would be born in a room where the animals inhabited not the people that's possible he means that but I think it's more likely that there's something about the cloth something about the way the baby was wrapped and again the idea that if he was wrapped in a manner that seemed a little bit more like 
a body that had died, that to me could be possible. In other words, there could be this glimpse, this foreshadowing that he's born to die. And that's a possibility. But he says to them, there will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among men with whom he is pleased. Glory to God in the highest. One has said the theme of the whole Bible is Jonah chapter 2 verse 9. Salvation is of the Lord. And that could be the theme of the Bible. Now I think if I had to choose a theme verse of the Bible, I'd say it's Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. In Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, it talks about the, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And notice how that one there says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. Now the anointed one is the Messiah. So the Messiah is the anointed one and he's anointed with the Holy Spirit and he's anointed to preach good news or the gospel to the afflicted. And here, what did the angel say? Behold, I bring you good news. I bring you a gospel of great joy. And so here, glory to God in the highest because salvation is of the Lord. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Now, how can a man please God? How can a man please a holy God? Glory to God, we can see that, but peace on earth with, whom, with men on whom God is pleased. And, and we're going to look at that in a minute too. But what's the key to the passage? And what's the key to the message? And I think the key is, Behold, I bring you good news of a great joy which shall be for all the people for today. In the city of David is born for you a Savior. You see, that's the key, a Savior. Now, if you stop and think, what does the word Savior mean? Now, you have to go to seminary to get this. Took me years to understand it. But the word Savior means the one who saves. The Savior, the Savior of the world, the one who saves. Now, if he saves, what's that mean? It means I don't save myself. Now, that seems pretty simple, but I'm telling you, there's a whole world of difference between what most everyone else in the world believes and what the gospel of Jesus Christ tells us because the Bible tells us that he's the Savior he's the one who saves and that makes him unique that makes him unique let's look at some of these objections I think we'll have a little fun with this the first objection was this isn't Christianity narrow well the answer to that is yes it is Christianity is narrow in Luke chapter 13, verse 24, it reads, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. So it is narrow, and he says it's narrow. In Acts chapter 4, in verse 12, it says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So it's narrow. But let me stop, though, for a second and say, but that's not really the big or most important question because the question should not be, is it narrow or not? The question should be, is it true or not? In other words, something can be narrow and false, but something can be narrow and true. Now, let's say I, I have a, a pain in my stomach and I go to the doctor. And I go to the emergency room, and I have a tremendous pain in my stomach, and the doctor says, you have a ruptured appendix, and we need to take it out right away. And if we do, you'll be fine. And if we don't, you're going to die. Well, I'd say to the doctor, I think you're pretty narrow, doc. I mean, 
you know, it could be a lot of things. And what makes you think you know better than me anyway? I just think that is a narrow diagnosis, and that's just so exclusive, so precise. I mean, couldn't it be something else? Well, he'd say, you know what? You can think what you want, but I'm a doctor, and I know what it is, and if you don't get it out, you're going to die. So it could be a very narrow diagnosis, but that doesn't mean it's not a true diagnosis. In other words, just because something is narrow doesn't mean it's not true. So the most important question is not is it narrow, but is it true? That's the first thing. Well, the second thing, how could Christianity be true if the majority of people have not believed? Well, now that's kind of a funny one, isn't it? How, I had a guy tell me that one, it's kind of funny. He said, how could they be wrong if they have so many people in their church? Well, I could list a number of ways they could be wrong. But nevertheless, though, how could it be true if the majority of the people in the world don't believe it? Well, let's stop and say, think for a second. In Romans chapter 3, verse 4, it says, Let God be found true, though every man be found a liar. In other words, you see, if God says something, it's true. And if everybody believes it, fine. If nobody believes it, fine, because it doesn't determine what is true. Let's go back to my little silly story at the hospital emergency room. Let's say I had all my family in there with me. Let's say I had, a, had everybody here with me. I had everybody here with me in the emergency room. Uh, they couldn't fit them all in there. And the doctor says, you need to have your appendix taken out. But all my friends and family say, no, we think he's fine. He just needs some aspirin. Well, you know, how could the doctor be right if all of my friends and family say otherwise? Well, he could be right, and they could be wrong. And as we look at history, and even as we look at life, isn't it true so often that the majority is often wrong? Amen. To think that the majority of people are always right is just foolish. I mean, if you look at history, there's countless examples where many times majorities were wrong. So to say that the majority determines truth is just not a valid way to look at things. So again, the question isn't, how many people believe? The question is, is it true? That's the question. Number three, what matters is that you are sincere in what you believe. That's, again, silly. Think about Proverbs 14, verse 12. There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. I mean, there are many times people are sincere, and they are sincerely wrong. Again, my story. I'm in the hospital. He says, you need to have it taken out. I say, Doc, I'm fine. It'll go away. I could really be sincere. You know what? If I thought I could fly like a bird, I could be sincere. I could really believe I can fly. But if I go down on top of a big building and I take off, you know what? I'm not going to fly. Now, I could be sincere. But sincerity does not determine truth. So what we're trying to get at here in these objections here is not what the majority think. It's not whether it's narrow or not. It's not whether or not I'm sincere. Somebody once said, I have faith in faith itself. I don't have faith at all in faith itself. I have faith in a Savior who died on a cross. That's what I need to have faith in, not in some sincerity that I might claim for myself. Don't all religions basically teach the same thing? That's a common misunderstanding because the truth is, although many religions have some core moral beliefs, they don't at all teach the same thing. They don't at all teach the same thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4 says, Therefore, concerning the eating of things sacrificed to idols, we know that there is no such thing as an idol in the world. And that there is no God but one. In other words, there's idols, but that's not the true God. And what did Jesus say to the Samaritan woman, who I think in some ways was religious? 
He said to her, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Now that was very politically incorrect. But it was true. Because the scriptures teach that the Jews have a Savior. Now, that Savior is not just the Savior for the Jews, but they do have a Savior. Remember, Jesus said to that Samaritan woman, well, she actually said to him, she says, we know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ, when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And then she goes into the town and tells all the men, come see a man who's told me all the things that I have done. And then they come out and they talk to Jesus. And then in typical male fashion, they say to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. You see, in John chapter 4, you see two of the greatest titles of Jesus found right there. He's the Messiah of Israel, and he's the Savior of the world. And he said to her, you worship what you do not know, but we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews, because the Messiah, or the Christ of Israel, is the Savior of the world. And they don't teach the same things. Romans chapter 11, verse 6 says, for if it is by grace... It is not by works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. Romans 4, 4 and 5 says, Now to the one who works, his wage is not reckoned as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned as righteousness. You see, Christianity is so unique. Christianity is the only faith where there's a triune God, where there's a trinity, where there's a second person of the Godhead who becomes a man, and this person who becomes a man is God and man in one person, and he dies on a cross, and he sheds his blood, and he pays the penalty for sins, and salvation is a free gift received by faith alone when someone will say, there's nothing I can do. I have broken the law of God, but I am trusting it on the cross. I'm trusting in him. I'm receiving it. You see, Christianity is a message where God does the work and man receives the blessing. This particular newscaster was castigated on television. Oh, he's holier than thou. He's making a judgment on other religions. And it was interesting because one of those who was so critical of him called in a man who was, who was claiming to be a Christian preacher, who was a, a Christian minister. And yet I really don't think he was a Christian minister because I don't think he understood the, the essential, basic part of the gospel. And this man says, we should all work together. We should have respect for all religions. And I'm certainly not trying to be dis disrespectful to anybody, but I am wanting to exalt the fact that there's one God and one man who's a mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony born at the proper time, and he's the only Savior there is. And that makes Christianity unique. Most religions, there is no religion like Christianity. Because religions are what men do to find favor with God. Christianity is what God has done in Christ to save and redeem a fallen mankind that cannot save themselves. So they're not the same. How about this one? Doesn't God basically accept good people? Now that's an interesting one, but I want you to listen to this. In Luke chapter 18, verse 19, a ruler questioned him, saying, Good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Well, if Christianity basically it means that God accepts good people, we've got a big problem because the Bible tells us there aren't any good people. And that's exactly what the Bible tells us. It says there aren't any good people in the ultimate sense. Now, if you've kept, I've said this before, if you have kept the Ten Commandments perfectly your whole life, I'd like to have you stand up and come up and speak to us because we all like to hear from you. 
But there's no one who has lived their whole life perfectly keeping the Ten Commandments their whole life. That means we've broken the law of God. And that means we've sinned. And that means there aren't any good people. So if there aren't any good people, most people think, well, good people go to heaven. But the problem the Bible tells me is there aren't any good people. So then who goes to heaven? Forgiven people. Forgiven people go to heaven. Because there aren't any good people, but there, anyone can be forgiven. So that's one of the objections. Let's go on here. What if you're sorry for your sins? Won't God accept you if you're really sorry for your sins? But what's the problem there? Well, we read in the book of Hebrews, it says in verse 9, chapter, chapter 9, verse 22, uh, and according to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. So you see, there has to be a payment for sin. There has to be a payment made. So even if I'm sorry, that doesn't mean I've, I paid the price, that I paid the penalty. I mean, I could go out of here this morning, get in my car and slip on the ice, and you might have a brand new Mercedes out there. And I drive out of the driveway, maybe a little faster than I should. I'm hungry, I'm going to lunch. And I run into your car, your new Mercedes. And I get out, shake myself off. I say, you know, I'm really sorry. <laughs> well, you know, you might say, I'm sorry too, but me being sorry doesn't solve the problem. I've ruined your car. Just because I'm sorry, it doesn't solve the problem. There has to be a payment. Hopefully my insurance company will pay, but you get the drift, right? And when we've broken God's law, there has to be a payment. Now, there has been a payment made but that payment was made not by me, but by another. And again, think of that verse. According to the law, one may almost say all things are cleansed with blood. And without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. There has to be a payment, and the payment is made by blood. But if I'm just a mere man, I wouldn't be able to pay for the sins of someone else because I'm paying for my own sins. I'm a sinner myself. But if I'm God, who's without sin, and I'm dying on a cross and if I have infinite righteousness in my nature so that the weight or the magnitude of my suffering is sufficient to pay for the sins of the world then I can pay for your sins and Christianity is unique because there's only one sinless divine person ever born and that sinless divine person lived a sinless life He's holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners. And that sinless, holy, undefiled, separate person went to a cross. And on that cross, he became sin for me. God made him who knew no sin to be sin on my behalf that I might become the righteousness of God in him. And he's the only one. So God doesn't accept me because I'm sorry. He accepts me because I'm forgiven because someone else paid for my sin. And then this, is Christianity arrogant? No, remember Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other, for everyone who exalts himself shall be humbled, but he who humbles himself shall be exalted. And think about 1 Timothy. Paul said, this is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. So Christianity isn't a faith that is arrogant. It shouldn't be. Christians don't say they're better than other people. We might be worse than other people. What's the difference? We have someone who died in our place. And that's the last one, this one here. If Christianity works for you, great. It just doesn't work for me. That's kind of a, a deceptive one because it's trying to, in a clever way, say, well, it might be okay. It's just not for me. But unless you've perfectly kept the Ten Commandments, it's the message for you. Because all people need to be forgiven. Think of 1 Timothy 2, 5, and 6. There is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. In other words, if you're a man, if you're a mankind, 
If you're a male or a female, this is the message for you because you have been made in the image of God and there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all. The testimony born at the proper time. And what does ransom mean? It means a payment. It means he paid the penalty. As it says in the book of Matthew, the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom payment in the place of the many. It says in 1 John chapter 2, he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. It means he died, he suffered, he paid the penalty, he satisfied the wrath of God and satisfied the justice of God. He paid the penalty. And everybody needs to have that penalty payment for themselves. So if he's good for anybody, he's good for everybody. And if he's not good for everybody, he's not good for anybody. But the Bible tells me he's good for everybody. And I believe it. And the Christian gospel is unique. It's unique. And remember when people say it's narrow and they say oh, it's arrogant. Remember, this is the same Bible, though, that makes an offer to everyone. Where does it say in Isaiah? It says, there is no God besides me, a righteous God and a Savior. There's none except me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. Now, it's an exclusive way, but it's a universal invitation. Even in the Old Testament, even the nation of Israel, the prophets are saying, I am God and there is no other, a righteous God and a Savior. There's none except me. Turn to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. We could go on and on. The Messiah is to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. And I will make you a light of the nation so that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. It's a message to everybody. In the, in the book of Romans he says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Apostle John says, all that the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. So it's an exclusive message, but it's a universal invitation. And it's saying that whoever you are, Jew or Gentile, male or female, you trust in the Messiah, you trust in the Savior of the world, and you'll be forgiven. And back to our question, what, John, Matthew 11, come to me all ye who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. If you're weary and heavy laden, come to him. He'll give you rest. He said to the Samaritan woman, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. It's a universal invitation. Remember it said, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. How can God be pleased with a man? Well, Hebrews 11 verse 6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. So how can God be pleased with us? Well, he can be pleased with us because the Savior has paid for our sins and he's done a complete work. And if we put our faith in him and our trust in him, and I've thought about it before, God asks us to believe. Why does he ask us to believe? Because if we had to do something else, we could boast in what we've done. But believe is the only thing he could ask us to do. Where what does it mean to believe? It means that I am boasting in what Jesus did. I am not trusting in what I do, but I am trusting in what he did. I'm trusting in what he did on the cross. 
What does it mean to believe? Believe or to trust or place your faith in Him means that I'm, I've acknowledged I cannot pay for my sins, but I believe that a Savior has been born and that He's died in my place and He's shed His blood and He's paid my penalty and I am trusting in Him as my Savior. What do I want you to do this morning? If you've never trusted in Christ, I want you to understand that it's not what you and I do, but it's what he did on the cross. And if you're witnessing to people and you hear some of these objections, don't be don't be overwhelmed by these objections. These objections are really not big object they're not a big problem. They're they're based on a faulty logic. It doesn't make any difference if the majority believe or not. It's still true. It doesn't make any difference if it's narrow or not. It's still true. It doesn't make any difference what other people believe. It's still true because he became a man and he lived a life that was sinless and he died on a cross and he was raised from the dead and God has declared him to be the Savior of all men. And he said, come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Will you come to him? Will you trust in him? And then will you be a messenger for him? And will you let the light of the gospel? It says you're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you might proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Will you go out and be a light? Think of what the angel said. We'll leave with this. The birth of, this is my quote. We'll get to the angel in a second. The birth of Jesus Christ set into motion the essential and exclusive plan of God for salvation, a savior. Modern political correctness aside, he is the necessary man. He is the, what do they say, sinai qua non, without which not. He is essential. He's the necessary man. But if you trust in him, oh, you're forgiven. And the angel said it better than we can. Do not be afraid. Behold, I bring you good news of a great joy, which shall be for all the people. For today in the city of David is born for you a Savior. Now, again, what does Savior mean? The one who saves. It's so simple, but it's so profound. He saves if you will let him. It's not you working hard. It's him working on the cross. There's born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, what a great gospel. What a great Savior. What good news. I bring you good news of a great joy, which shall be for all the people. Lord, may that joy be ours today. If there's one here this morning who is not sure their sins are forgiven, not sure that if they were to die, they'd go to heaven. Friend, I invite you to pray with me with confidence. Dear God, I have broken your law, but I believe that Jesus Christ is God who became a man. I believe he lived a sinless life. I believe he died on a cross. I believe he shed his blood. And I believe his blood paid the penalty for my sins. You've said without shedding of blood there is no forgiveness. But I believe that his blood paid the penalty for my sins. And oh God, I am trusting in Jesus Christ right now as my Savior. I'm not trusting that I go to church. I'm not trusting that I was baptized. I'm not trusting that I've given money. I am trusting that on the cross he died for me. You said the word of the cross is to those who are perishing foolishness, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. And I'm trusting in the cross, and I'm trusting in my Savior, 
who's raised from the dead, who's seated at the right hand. Dear Lord, I accept. I receive your offer. I receive the free gift of forgiveness in Jesus Christ. I trust him as my Savior. And help me if I have. Help me to be a light for him. Help me by the Holy Spirit be a witness for him. Help me, O oh God, to shine. And Lord, give me confidence. We live in this crazy world where we're attacked all the time. This can't be true. This can't be true. This can't be right. Oh Lord, help us to stand on the, the rock. You've laid a rock in Zion. Tried and true, precious cornerstone. He who believes in him will not be disappointed. Lord, we pray in his name. Uphold your people, we ask. Amen.